In 2021, an 11,000-year-old stone relief was found in Seyburk, southeastern Turkey, and until now, no one knew what it meant. So today, I will unravel this mystery and explain how a discovery in the 1960s in southeastern Turkey was deemed an impossible find at the time, and it then resulted in the most amazing archaeological find of an ancient site, the site of Gebekli Tepe, a 12,000-year-old settlement that was used by hunter-gatherers. Gebekli Tepe has always fascinated people, and it is one of the most requested topics I've been asked to cover. And so in this video, I will use the latest archaeological information from the Gebekli Tepe archaeological team, including information directly from their project coordinator, Dr. Lee Clare. And with this, I will explain the site's role in the evolution of farming, religion, the creation of a pantheon of new gods, and I will also reconstruct ancient stories using art and iconography found at the site, which would have been told around 12,000 years ago. This is a story about transition, the evolution of society, the creation of gods, the myths of hunter-gatherers, and the conception of modern civilization. And as such, it is worth enjoying with a good cup of tea. So, sit down, relax, and welcome to Crackenford. Gebekli Tepe is one amongst many sites in the Tas Tepe or Stone Mounds region located in San Lifur, province of southeastern Turkey. Here, over 20 sites dating from around 12,500 years ago to 10,200 years ago have been discovered, and these are known as pre pottery. Neolithic sites. These sites are all linked due to their architecture and artwork being similar, suggesting that the people who inhabited them had similar beliefs and probably similar language. And by studying the information found across these sites, I will try and reconstruct some of their beliefs. And I'll do this by focusing on Gebekli Tepe, as it is one of the larger sites. But before we can do this, we need to clarify some misconceptions as some people believe that Gebekli Tepe holds esoteric knowledge or was built by a now lost ancient advanced civilization. However, the hill, which is a large limestone ridge with an artificial mound on top of it, is a very common occurrence in the Near East, and these are often referred to as tepes or hoyuks in Turkish, or they're called tells in Arabic. Now, our knowledge of this site started in the 1960s when archaeological fragments were discovered around this site, including the tops of what are now the famous tea pillars However, it was not until 1994 that official excavations began, and these were led by the late Claire Schmidt of the University of Erlangen-Nuremberg, alongside official Turkish organisations and institutions. And whilst Schmidt's work was excellent, some of it is now 30 years old, and much more excavation has been done, and his findings have been revised now and updated. But we still find that many people's knowledge of the site remains based on his original findings, and the media continues to regurgitate his original perceptions of the site. And so therefore I think it's important I provide you with the latest information from Dr. Lee Clare, the current project coordinator for the archaeological work at Gebekli Tepe. So, the first question is, why was Gebekli Tepe built? And the thoughts of many academics 60 years ago was that hunter-gatherers were nomadic and they had no desire, technical ability or enough resources to build such a site as Gebekli Tepe. And so, such a site didn't seem possible. And this is probably the key to so much fascination about the site and the reason why it's turned our thinking on its head. Well, that is the perception anyway. But the truth is that this isn't a new piece of history being inserted into our timeline of human progress. It is a find that fills a gap we had in history. And so, understanding that, then let's clear up a few things quickly based on the latest archaeological information. First off, there's absolutely no evidence at all of the domestication of animals or of cereal at Gebekli Tepe, and this means this is not the site of a Neolithic agricultural farming culture, nor was farming developed here. Now, whilst there is no doubt that agrarian culture 
was filtered into Sasati. At this point in time, when this was being built, the Sati was still very much a hunter-gatherer Sasati. Now, also near Gobekli Tepe is another site known as the Callahan Tepe, which is very similar and which is commonly said to be an older site than Gobekli Tepe. This is not the case. There is no evidence we have confidence in any way to suggest otherwise. Yes, there has been carbon dating of material from Callahan Tepe that is older than 12,000 years, but this data is considered to be an outlier um, based on material that wasn't part of the original Callahan Tepe site. But there are slightly older sites, and these do show more primitive styles of buildings, and thus allow us to understand that Gobekli Tepe wasn't just built out of nowhere, but it was an evolution of buildings from hundreds, if not over thousands of years before. Now, also Gobekli Tepe was in use for at least a couple of thousand years, which means it developed and changed during its lifetime. And whilst Gobekli Tepe is not a temple per se, the original construction, which consisted of special buildings, the buildings with tea pillars, would have had ceremonial and ritual events happening within them on various occasions, meaning that there was some religious consideration around the buildings and what they contained. But alongside this, we also see that there are permanent settlement buildings, or what I guess we should call homes. And these were built around the special buildings, indicating that they were also built after the special buildings. So this place was a permanent settlement, but because the buildings were later, it suggests that perhaps permanent settlement was later. However, it is very possible that earlier settlement buildings were there, but they were made from organic materials such as wood rather than the stone houses, and these would have been dismantled and or decayed, and so we have zero trace of them at the moment. And so why do hunter-gatherers have a permanent settlement is a good question, and I'll answer that in a minute. But first, I also want to add that whilst we often see pictures of Gobekli Tepe as being uncovered without a roof, we are absolutely sure these buildings had roofs. This is indicated through grooves on the top of tea pillars, suggesting woods was laid on top of them, but also because the walls of the rooms were made of plaster and there were dyes used to colour the art, and this would have been washed away, the art, the colour, the, the plaster, if there were no roofs, and that would make no sense at all. But perhaps the most convincing argument is the evidence we find for wooden beams. Now, whilst the environment isn't conducive to preserving organic material, and so we don't find wooden beams as such, what we do find in archaeological terms is the negative space a wooden beam would have been in. In effect, if you find the soil and then uncover it, you'll find a wooden beam shaped space within the soil where a beam would have been, but which has decayed over time. And these are in evidence at the site. So following on from this, there is also a narrative at one time at least that these sites were deliberately buried in a kind of termination ritual. And we do see behaviour in certain rooms of buildings at other sites, such as Callahan Tepe, of this happening. But in Gebekli Tepe, this doesn't seem to be the case. The reason it is buried is because of where it was built. The site is built on a hill, and so slippage from the surrounding soil and subsidence as well from higher ground seems to play the large role in burying the site and pushing the site inwards so that we see within the site's lifetime walls having to be rebuilt to compensate for this slippage and we do see rooms getting smaller over time as earth falls into them and we do see therefore multiple walls to combat this. A really good way to understand this further is looking at modern day Rome which is a very clear example where we see the Roman Forum uh, which was in use 2000 years ago uh, at least a few meters below modern day Rome and the roads being used so imagine this effect after 2000 years of, of, of a few meters but then multiply that by four which is 8000 years the age when Quebec Tepe would stop being used and imagine how 
buried they should be. So we're very confident of that. And the last thing I really want to cover, and I'll talk about more in the video, is Gobekli Tepe being used as an astronomical site. Often there's a T-pillar represented called the Vulture Stone, uh, which has a number of animals on it, and these are, are said to represent star constellations. But the fact is that hunter-gatherers were certainly not using the same constellations as we know today, 12,000 years ago. Yes, we do see one example of Earth's major being used in the cosmic hunt, one of our oldest stories, but that is a unique example. And on top of that, there's only this one vulture stone. This is really used in explaining this astronomical alignment. There are 200 pillars at Gobekli Tepe, maybe more. We haven't uncovered it all yet. And if we're only using one, then that's a case of taking data out of context. It's an outlier. And so, again, exceptionally unlikely to represent these star constellations. And with that, I think that is probably a wrap up of the key issues to date. And so, what we really see is that Gobekli Tepe was a site that was a natural progression and evolution from earlier sites. Uh, albeit a larger site than most. And whilst all this gives us a glimpse of what was happening there, it still doesn't ask the question, why was it built? So let me answer that for you. Within archaeology, we talk about a culture called the pre-pottery culture, which existed in the Neolithic period, and so we refer to this as the PPN. And this is split into two eras, PPNA, with the older period, and PPNB, the younger period, and this is important to us as it denotes a time before pottery was invented and so pottery wasn't being used. And this really provides us with a really vital clue as to why we think Gobekli Tepe was built, and that is for storage, and specifically for the storage of food. Now, research has shown, and quite detailed research, that a single person working very hard for three to maybe four weeks at the end of summer could harvest enough grain to feed a family of four for a whole year. And if you were a hunter-gatherer and you came across a fertile grassland with plenty of grain, would you not want to spend a month getting a year's worth of food? I mean, life was hard back then. I mean, you may think life is hard today, but back then, life was much, much tougher. And so you gathered resources when you could. The trouble is that if you harvested a year's worth of grain, then what would you do with it You know, for a year? You couldn't just leave it where you harvested it because people from other tribes or pests and vermin such as rodents would eat it and steal it. And after all the effort of harvesting the grain, you really don't want it not to be protected. You may have thought about carrying it with you, but... That was just impractical. The grain harvested by a single person in a month would easily be over 200 kilos or over 400 pounds in weight. You just wouldn't be able to hunt meat and take this much grain with you at the same time. You had to have another solution. And the solution was storage. And because there were no small containers to store food safely away from rodents, such as pottery, because this is the pre-pottery era, the next best thing was to have a building or a room which could be protected to a degree at least. And so we find probable reason for Gobekli Tepe and the other sites being built, and that is that it was principally a store for grain. And to store a massive grain needs a big room, and this needs many people to build the room, and these people need then to share the grain, and so they would have to live near it. And whilst it was being stored and looked after, some people could continue to go out hunting and come back with meat to supplement the grain for food. And so the result of this evolution is humans not becoming agricultural farmers per se, but hunter-gatherers with agrarian cultural traits coming into their thoughts and behaviours. And this in turn would affect their beliefs and so their gods and their rituals. And I'll talk about this a bit more in a little while, but first let's have a talk about the evolution of farming. The evolution of farming didn't happen overnight. It was the eating of wild grasses by humans that would eventually lead to it, something 
that had been going on for thousands of years by the time Gebekli Tepe was built, but we have no evidence wild grasses were harvested in mass until around 12,000 years ago, and this is because we considered hunter-gatherers to be generally nomadic, with no fixed abode, and the mass harvesting of any food would require storage. But this was an interesting period of time for the Earth, and the climate changed a lot between 20,000 and 10,000 years ago. Uh, and when Gebekli Tepe was built, Earth had just recovered from the younger driest period, where temperatures had lowered significantly, and now the temperature is warming up. There was quite a lot of rain in southeastern Turkey, and this climate change seems to have brought about an abundance of wild grasses. And so, with the knowledge that harvesting the grain at a certain time of year would allow everyone to eat until the following year, then agrarian culture slowly grew and developed within the hunter-gatherer cultures around the Near East, until it reaches a tipping point where communities see a benefit in harvesting as much grain as possible from the wild grasses and then storing it. Now, we see this happening 12,000 years ago, but it would be around another 2,000 years before grasses were being deliberately planted in the Near East and a particular kind of grass to help combat what would have been harsh conditions as the Earth's climate changed again. And so when that happened, the hunter-gatherer cultures then could be considered Neolithic agricultural farmers. And as I say, this was probably brought about because grasses like rye, very hardy grasses, could grow in the, well, changing climate. Now this evolution of full-time agricultural farming happened in what we know as the Fertile Crescent, which is a stretch of fertile land going along the path of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and eventually down into the Nile. But the earliest settlements of all that seem to develop the first stages of agrarian culture occur in what is sometimes known as the Golden Triangle, which is slightly to the north of the Fertile Crescent. And so we can feel confident in saying that there was probably influence from the people in the Golden Triangle with those in the Fertile Crescent. There was probably some overlap, either through trade, um, but certainly ideas possibly travelled about farming. And what you may find about interesting about this map is this shows where agricultural farming started across the world and the dispersal of these start points also suggests that there was no connection between major cultural advances to start this process. And so this also gives us confidence that areas around Gobekli Tepe is where the very first agrarian cultures developed because there are no earlier cultures that could have influenced them. And so this is where we would see the first cultural, societal and belief systems be affected by these new ways and their demands on people. After exploring the possible reasons for the construction of Gobekli Tepe in this primary use, it's now time to delve into the art and architecture to gain an insight into the beliefs and rituals of the so-called nomadic hunter-gatherers who may have frequented this sacred site. Now, while Gobekli Tepe wasn't a temple in the traditional sense of the word, it is evident that that religious beliefs at the time were practiced here. You know, this was a sacred place for ritual and ceremony. There is red ochre found in certain enclosures, in certain places, and this often indicates that a sacred ritual was taking place. We see a boar jaw near a boar figure, which implies a possible animal sacrifice or killing, and this is further reinforced by the depiction of dead or dying cattle or auric, on pillar 66, here the animal's knees are bent and its tongue is hanging out, suggesting it is dead or dying. And why is it dead or dying? Well, probably sacrifice played a part. This was key in the beliefs of people around this time. One pillar, which there's been much debate about, has been pillar 43, the vulture stone. As mentioned earlier, some people have associated this with astronomical uh, alignment to constellations, which I do not think is true. However, if one considers that Gobekli Tepe relied on harvesting grasses at particular times of year, 
they would have to know when this time of year was, when it was coming up. And also, considering that, when they should hunt for meat and what sort of meat should be hunted when. And if we consider this and look at pillar 43, then some things stand out. This pillar, the vulture sign, is probably a type of calendar, with animals predicting the seasons when to do things, and not astronomical occurrences. And the reason we can feel quite confident about this is that cranes are migratory birds and scorpions, although around all year, it's only the wet seasons when they become more visible as they look to find dry shelter within the settlements. We also see wild grasses and a vulture, possibly with an egg. And all these things are very specific things that happen in at, at different times of the year. And so knowing when these things happened would help people ascertain when to gather certain types of food. And this isn't unique. There is a paper which was released in January 2023 which showed a form of proto-writing was being used tens of thousands of years ago to keep track of animals' migrations by hunter-gatherers by drawing pictures of animals and marking them in ways to represent how many lunar cycles pass for particular events to happen, whether migratory or uh, gestation. So we are aware that hunter-gatherers were able to calculate this information. Pillar 56 is an excellent example of a richly decorated pillar due to the number of animals on it. There are 55 in all, and they are so densely carved together that identifying all of them is a challenge. But we do see ducks and leopards, snakes, cranes, and probably what is an eagle with a snake in its talons in the centre of it. And what is interesting is that this bird of prey is facing the opposite direction to all the other animals, perhaps suggesting its importance in this scene. And so perhaps it is a main character in a myth of animals. However, trying to understand this story of an eagle catching its prey as other animals move away from it is really so far out of our grasp. It is a story we will probably never be able to reconstruct. When humans stepped away from nature, I've always stated that with settlements and agricultural farming, we would start to see the gods personified. And the reason is that as people lived in larger and larger settlements, their connection with nature lessens. Their direct need for nature lessens. Instead, humans would then rely on other humans to fix problems. And so we see the spirits found in nature, in the animistic nature of things, slowly fade as gods are personified to look like the humans who rule. And to me, one of the fascinating things we see here at Gobekli Tepe is what is probably the earliest representations of this transition within their art. You see, before Gobekli Tepe, our evidence suggests that art focused on our natural surroundings, the animals we relied on for food, the animals that considered us food. But at Gobekli Tepe, we see the first clear and significant representations of humans in art, from life-size statues that represent humans, such as the Earth of Man, to tea pillars that are considered anthropomorphic shapes, with arms, with loincloths, uh, jewellery, often unique in, in its symbology, to images we see in reliefs, and to human figures in composite carvings. This is the first time we see humans properly represented in art, and the general consensus is that it is showing humans are starting to separate themselves from nature, believing they are stronger than nature, that they can control nature. Although these people are still hunter-gatherers, they still understand nature, but they also now believe that they have defeated nature. And this feeds through to the narratives we see in some of the art. But are these figures actually conveying any specific information about the culture and its beliefs. It has been observed that many of the figures in the art, not just of humans but of animals, indicate that the figures are of male sex, which suggests a society where males are the focus of power. However, a majority of the human bones discovered are female, suggesting that females were given more burial rights. Now, while they're it's still much opportunity to find far more human remains at the Quebec Tepe, and this position of how 
people seem to be or how the sexes seem to be placed may change. But until then, there's an interesting aspect of what could be a transition here. You see, in societies with social hierarchies, stress increases, especially amongst the lower echelons of that society. And as a result, people would rely more on help from powerful people, such as a shaman. Although this was a settlement with a population of around two to three hundred people, it wasn't particularly complex and was probably quite egalitarian. Therefore, it would indicate that such a religious figure was male, as this is the norm we see in such societies. And the beliefs would have the shaman going into a trance and visiting the spirit world of the ancestors and animals to find answers to problems. But for completeness, we see female shamans appearing in societies which are more complex, with more hierarchy and therefore more stress, and these female shamans tend not to visit the spirit world, but instead get possessed by spirits in a ritualistic setting, often with dancing and music. And so, based on archaeological evidence we have so far, we have to assume that this was an animistic culture with shamanistic rituals with probably male shaman. Um, and we can delve a little deeper into this. There are many examples we see from cultures that continue to exist in a remote form from the expansion of colonialism and from the development of towns and cities and from farming. And in these cultures, we see nature continue to take a key role in beliefs. Examples of this are the Inuit, who do not have gods, but do have stories about why things happen. And these usually have many animals or animal-human hybrids that form a key part of these stories. We also see in the Siberian cultures, we have forms of totemism with bears in particular having a key role in culture as it acts as the king of the animals and so is closely related to the beliefs of the Inuit in some ways. And for a final example we see in Australia the First Nation Australians having spirits all around them representing animals and their ancestors. There are again no formal deities as we would recognise them if for example you follow the Abrahamic religion but if you are interested in these cultures, then I have made videos about them, if you want to watch those after this. Now, if we then look at Paleolithic and Neolithic art, it is then dominated by animals. Cave paintings of bears and horses and lions, carvings of ducks and reindeer and, and more lions. Uh, back then, it is generally thought that we saw ourselves as equal to other animals, or perhaps it is better to say we thought as animals being like us. But again, in all the remnants of stories we know from these times, there are no deities, there are no gods in human form. But then we start to settle, and the first settlements start showing human forms with animals, as well as human forms on their own, such as the earth or figure and the tea pillars. And so we see humans believing that whoever created nature was probably human-like because humans have conquered nature and so whatever is more powerful than a human must be a human-like being and not a animal type being. Now one thing we've seen multiple times within the archaeology of Quebec de Tepe are representations of people with no heads, particularly men with no heads. On the vulture stone in the corner there is a man with no head the tea pillars seem to represent a man with no head, or at least with no face. And so this leads us to consider if there is something about the head that became a sacred truth. Now, archaeologists have found fragments of calf bones at the tepes, and so there are some who speculate when putting these finds together that the people who spent time here belong to a Neolithic skull cult. And so, a culture that embraced rituals around the heads of the dead. And some of these remains uncovered during fieldwork at Gobeki Tepe include sections of skulls bearing grooves, also holes and the occasional dab of ochre, a red dye often used in rituals. There are three adult skulls, particularly that show signs of having been carved with flint after being scalped and... After their scalp, they're defleshed. 
However, the marks left from such behaviour are normally light and incidental. I mean, it is hard to get flesh off a skull, but it could be controlled. But the marks we find on these skulls, which have gone through this process, are very deep and seem to have been deliberately made. And so these 12,000-year-old skull carvings are the oldest of their kind that we have ever found and we can then make conclusions from the carvings that they were practical as opposed to being artistic and the reason i say this is that there are a lot of carvings on stone at quebec Tepe, and the quality is reasonably good but the carvings in the skulls is rough and so archaeologists believe that these markings were used to help hang up skulls as decoration rather than the carvings themselves on the skulls used for decorations. However, the idea of a skull cult uh, was first mentioned before we realised Quebec Tepe was a settlement, and so these skulls were thought to commemorate their ancestors when first found. And whilst this may still be the case, um, it may mean, now we know family settled here for thousands of years, that this may just be a form of ancestor worship instead, especially with the rising power of humans over nature you know, and one should remember that your first ancestors who did this special deed of collecting grain and building these buildings and this in turn would boost the idea of group identity at the settlement something that would have been important to build a community and this was then further enhanced through rituals and feasts but one final piece of art I want to look at, which I mentioned at the very beginning of the video, is this 11,000 year old relief in Seyburg, which isn't in Gebeki Tebi, but it's close by. Now, whilst many have said it is a narrative, I'm not aware of any published examples of what it could mean. And so let me explain what we could have here and what it could mean, especially in the context of everything I've spoken about so far. So when looking at paintings or reliefs, we should take note of the people within the scene as each occurrence of a person can often represent a different scene within the narrative and so here we have two scenes one with a bull or an orc and a man holding something and one with two leopards either side of a man again holding something and so let me make it easier for you to see what's going on and so we can see that we are left with a man and a bull and we know it's a bull because of the horns and because of something else going on in this picture. The man uh, with bended legs is probably dancing whilst looking at the bull, and in his hands is something that looks like the tail of a bull, but the bull in the picture has a tail. And so it doesn't take much imagination to realise that the man has probably castrated the bull and is holding the bull's testes. And so... The dancing going on is probably his celebration in achieving such an outrageous task as one must forget that in these times, bulls were not domesticated, were considered very large animals, and you know they are wild, and so to capture one and remove its testicles from it, whilst it is probably still alive, is quite a challenge. And we believe the bull is probably alive because because the legs are straight, where we see other bulls depicted with bended legs at Gobekli Tepe, and these seem to represent the dying animals. And so the man is celebrating literally power over this great creature. And so what do you do when you have done this? Well, let's look at scene two. Here the man is showing how much of a man he is between two leopards. And the way to look at this is that it is probably a coming of age ceremony. A young man castrates a bull, celebrates in dance, and has to ritually show he is a man capable not only of defeating nature, but being sexually mature. The leopards are again probably alive and may well have been restrained whilst the young man proves his manhood. And so, to me, this is the oldest narrative we have of a young man coming of age through dominating a bull and being fearless while showing he is a sexually mature man. Of course, there is a chance I'm wrong and if you have any ideas about what it could be, I'll really be interested in hearing them in the comments 
below and then to understand why you think those things, especially, especially considering the other art going on. Now, whilst we see slightly older sites and archaeology supporting the evolution of buildings and sort of the formation of sites within the region across hundreds of years leading up to the building of Gobekli Tepe, it is really at the age of Gobekli Tepe where we see the start of a transition of culture from hunter-gatherer to hunter-gatherer with agrarian cultural attributes. But Gobekli Tepe was not strictly a farming community. No animals or grasses were domesticated here, not that we have found anyway. And we can tell that from looking at the seeds within the site and how large they are. Domesticated seeds tend to be larger and the animal bones as well in the archaeological records suggest wild animals rather than domesticated animals. But this doesn't mean it couldn't have influenced other cultures that did farm in later centuries. We also have the imagery of pillars, which could be mistaken for symbology similar to that found, let's say, in Egyptian hieroglyphs or even early forms of the alphabet. However, we need to be clear here that whilst the images are similar, there is no continuation of these figures in archaeology in the region and so this suggests to us that the art forms found in Gebekli Tepe were abandoned and then reinvented in later cultures and so this could suggest that the religion and beliefs practiced here also died out with the art when the site was abandoned. That's not to say other cultures didn't have similar religions but certainly the Neolithic farmers who were about to dominate the landscape here did not have their cultural beliefs significantly influenced from the culture at Gebekli Tepe. The trouble with myth, and so religion as religion is myth to those who do, do not consider it sacred, is that not all data can be quantified and so studied in an objective manner. And so some of the things I have mentioned here are speculative but on the most probable side of this speculation we know religion affects the social dynamic of society and so transforms culture over time the question we must ask is why hunter gatherers decided to harvest so much food as to need to create a settlement to store it was there a member of the community who persuaded them in a in the name of an ancestor or a spirit or a god were feasts due to there being so much grain a common way to bring community together to help build the settlement was having these feasts with all that grain the catalyst to say hey let's build a store for this and then did that help them create these tea pillars to carve and immortalize myth and then there is the issue of conflict as with the creation of settlements there would inevitably be conflict if not within the settlement itself with cultures outside who wanted access to the land and how was this managed we see many similar sites around Gobekli Tepe and perhaps all these work together were allies against other cultures but also the populations of Gobekli Tepe were more than likely from areas quite far away so why did so many people migrate here and how were they all accepted? And so there's all sorts of questions such as why was the site built? Did feasts continue to attract other people? Were there fertility rituals? Would this have joined people together from various tribes to create a large community? For me, when people ask why did we stop the easy hunter-gatherer lifestyle and start farming, my answer is because of food, because of how it affected the birth rate, we see from the start of farming a significant growth in population in humans who farm. And we might say that, are they eating better food? But the real reason, or a very specific real reason, is that mothers who were breastfeeding their children did so up until the children were about four years of age before farming. After farming, we see this reduce, we can see this to the teeth of children, you know, how they're developing by a year or two which would mean that there would be more milk for more children meaning the higher success rate of raising a child because they would be healthier which then in turn improved further when humans started to consume milk from domesticated animals such as goats and sheep and cows but all this was to come it doesn't answer questions about the change 
in the religious landscape. And what we do know is that myth evolves, evolves with the environment and society. These are the two of the biggest contributing factors to the evolution of myth. And as we see the buildings change, we see walls rebuilt, pillars moved, society is growing, hierarchies emerge, no doubt the religious beliefs change and myths evolve. We see in Gobeki Tepe that there is much symbolism around the snake, the bull, headless bodies and phallae. And did all these help influence myths and ritual that created divine beings and their new anthropomorphic gods? And if the beliefs didn't transfer over to future cultures, perhaps the anthropomorphic gods or the idea of these god-type figures in human form, the large T-pillars, would have been um, memorable and then talked about. As certainly, we see that in a society which is so different to anyone who saw it, we have to ask what stands out from other cultures. And if someone went to Gobeki Tepe and saw these T-pillars, it would be these. And so it could be possible to conclude that the first personified gods albeit gods without faces, although they did have some unique features. But perhaps these were the things that people considered gods at Gobeki Tepe and the gods that presided over the spirits of the animistic cosmos, the spirits that were probably venerated by earlier hunter-gatherers. And so while society at Gobeki Tepe was a self-serving function, it was populated by hunter-gatherers, they were still connected to the land surrounding Gobeki Tepe and these were part of their cosmos, the cosmos of hunter-gatherers where everything had a spirit and so perhaps this religion had these faceless human gods ruling over those spirits. Perhaps these gods with no name and no specific identity were an acknowledgement of humans' control of nature for as much as humans were conquering nature in reality the control of the universe in which all this happened must be by something that was similarly powerful, similar in shape, and so of human form. And so it is from this time that humans created gods in their own image. And for me, it is the site of Quebec Tepe and the similar sites that represent this transition from animism to anthropomorphic gods in the human form that controls their universe. Thank you to my patrons. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and watch this video if you want to hear more fascinating stories of myth. Take care.